this is the most brazen remark I've ever heard I had to get married. Because it takes two to tango, I guess I should have said that Maddie and I had to tie the knot otherwise. I might have felt a little lonely up there by myself. It wouldn't have happened if we hadn't intended it to. So even that is an unsubstantiated claim. My regular girlfriend Maddie, who I've been seeing for the past 12 months or more, said, James one Friday night. I've got some news for you. I grinned back at my fiancé, who is about 5 feet 6 inches tall, blonde, thin, and really stunning. Good news or bad, he asked. Uncertain. James, Maddie gave me a hesitant smile. Could be either. Depends on you, really. I will spare you the details of the rest of the conversation just to give you an idea of its trajectory. Let it be known that we were soon embracing, professing our love for one another, and contemplating the timing of my marital transition from girlfriend to wife. We can accommodate your family schedule, Maddie said. I've not really got any family left now that Auntie Beth has died, and I haven't got anyone back in Leicester that I'm still particularly friendly with. Sad as it may be, the truth remains. Tragically, Maddie's parents died in a motorcycle accident when she was a little girl. She was fostered for a while, until being taken in by Auntie Beth, a friend of Maddie's mother's who lived outside of Leeds. I never got the chance to meet my Auntie Beth, because she had died away a few weeks before I did. Everything had been done, and buried figuratively speaking by the time I returned from my business trip to Canada, Maddie had already gone to Leeds for the burial when she passed away. What about Beth's son, Maddie? I inquired with some reluctance, as she had interrupted us before whenever we had mentioned him. You used to be close to Tom, didn't you? Wouldn't you like him there on the day? Tom's in prison, James Maddie informed me, her irritation evident in her tone. I've told you before, I don't want to talk about him. My bad. It would have been wiser not to bring up Tom at all. I had no idea why or where he was serving time, but I did know it was at Her Majesty's pleasure. Dealing with a delicate subject requires a swift shift in strategy. My parents are both retired, so I think any date would suit them. The sooner the better. Then James, my soon-to-be wife, smiled back at me as she patted her still flat stomach. Her wrath melted away. Let's ring them now. Consequently, that happened. A small gathering of my family and our common acquaintances were there when we were married at the Bedford Registrar office, just four weeks after we moved in together. We enjoyed an amazing honeymoon in the West Indies, but Maddie's belly didn't start to show signs of being pregnant with our first child until many weeks after we got back. Hi, Beth. Meth. That was the name we gave to the precious little being who squealed its way into this world, all grown up with a set of digits and a pair of lungs that would keep us up at night. Because my mother's name was cumbersome and uncool, we decided to name our daughter after the woman who Maddie had considered a mother figure. That was totally on point and Maddie was totally into me because of it. Here is the information you requested. My marriage to Maddie was wonderful. We had our fair share of arguments, but we eventually worked them out and became very close as a couple, especially with our beautiful newborn baby. As she grew older, Beth's hair became noticeably lighter, and in certain lights you could almost make out a hint of ginger. Maddie was a filthy blonde, therefore Beth inherited her fair complexion and jet black hair color instead of mine. However, little Beth was more like me, she rarely got angry or even wept, in contrast to Maddie, who had always a tendency to be a bit emotional. A nice compromise, in the opinion of some, taking the best features of both worlds nonetheless, I must admit that I lacked the courage to propose this to my beloved wife. Unexpectedly, things started to go wrong at the Dawson household just after Beth turned three years old and we had been married for nearly four years. I was very satisfied with life and Beth was being her usual joyful self but Maddie seemed to be thinking about something. I was making a solid living, so she quit working not long before Beth was born and never came back. We had moved to a charming little village just north of Bedford at this point, and Maddie would take Beth into town at least twice a week for grocery shopping, medical appointments, or to see old co-workers. Indeed, it was pleasant that we occasionally had lunch together while I was in town. But recently, after her outings into town, she would return home in a very reflective state, as if something were troubling her. In the weeks following our introduction via a mutual acquaintance, Maddie went through moments of extreme moodiness when we began hanging out together. It was clear that her main concern was that we were developing strong feelings for each other too rapidly, but she had already gotten over that. Evidently, I inquired as to the nature of the issue, but all I received was the dreaded shake of the head. I thought she might be seeing another guy, 
but she was never seen without Beth by her side, so it didn't seem likely. I was right about that assumption, it turned out, but maybe it would have been better if it had been the only thing. I finally became more forceful and demanded, what on earth is wrong, Maddie, when she was truly miserable? She raised her sorrowful eyes to mine and stared at me for a long time before she finally spoke. I guess I owe you an explanation, James. You're going to find out soon anyway, so I might as well get it over with. I responded, find out what is the fear she expressed in her words grew. Is she sick? Did our lovely daughter have a problem? Her suggestion was to put Beth to bed, honey, and she sighed. Then come down and we'll have a talk. Taking advantage of the fact that Beth was so exhausted that she wasn't demanding that I read her a tale, I gathered her into a hug and carried her upstairs. Right, I was itching to descend again and diagnose the issue. I would have lingered with Beth longer if I had known then. God forbid I would have stayed in her bedroom the whole time if I had known what was coming. There is a missing. Come and sit here, James Maddy said, gesturing toward the chair across the table from her, which was hardly a promising omen. She began, James Honey before continuing after a long sigh. You've asked about Tom a number of times, and I've never told you anything, have I? No, I nodded in harmony. You always shut me down. Well, I guess it's about time I told you about Tom, Matty whispered. Tom is a couple of years older than me, and when I was younger he was just like an older brother after I went to live with him and his mother. I interjected. That sounds quite normal to bolster her confidence. Yes, but things changed as we got older, James Maddie added, averting my gaze. We weren't actually related in any way, and we became, well, like boyfriend and girlfriend. Nodding along, I was curious about the direction the talk was taking and worried that I wouldn't enjoy it. Then, as we got into our later teens, we became more than that, a whole lot more. Without getting too caught up in the meaning of a whole lot more, I inquired, what did his mother make of that while maintaining a calm voice? She was all in favor. Tom was a bit of a wild boy like his father had been before he died on his motorbike. I've never told you, but the reason my parents and Tom's were so friendly was that they were all bikers, hell's angels and all the whole lot. I yelled out, hell's angels in complete perplexion. Yes, Maddie responded. All four of them. But your parents died in a biking accident as well. Didn't they? Yes. They did, Maddie said, with a touch of sadness. They were in a big group going down to Brighton for a weekend when they went round a corner too fast and wrote themselves off. Knowing the specifics of her parents' downfall, I questioned with care, and Tom's dad I was astonished to hear that there was more to the story. That was just four months later on his way to work. He ended up under a lorry, and Auntie Beth had lost her husband and two best friends in such a short period that she never got on a bike again. She grew to hate the things. I empathized, saying, well, that's understandable because I'd never been a fan of those substances either. In my mind, everything with two wheels and an engine was either a bicycle or the front or rear part of a car, depending on whether it had an engine or not. That's when Auntie Beth took me in and bought me up as her own daughter, said Maddie. But she was in favor of Tom and you getting involved with one another. Maddie said, yes, she was her entire demeanor betraying the fact that she was still preoccupied with the past. As I said, Tom was a real wild one and desperately keen on motorbikes and rode them without any fears, just like his dad. Beth hated the thought of what might happen to him, and I guess she thought that I might be a good influence on him. And were you? I reckon not Maddie moaned. In fact, quite the reverse, and I ended up as wild as Tom was. We were part of a motorbike gang and got up to all sorts of things that we shouldn't be doing. Quite a lot of it things that the law said we shouldn't be doing. You mean doing things like speeding, I asked her. Oh yes, that all right, but an awful lot more as well. We all got quite a reputation with the local police. I wondered aloud, so that's how Tom got put away. Was it as I struggled to process the revelation that my beloved, youthful wife had a past as a biker? Hopefully that clarifies the tattoo on her buttocks, which she had always been reluctant to explain. Maddie seemed to be building the courage to tell me something, but she didn't respond right away. Last but not least, she whispered something like sort of, and I patiently awaited her response. We were out one evening with the bike club, and on our way back from Manchester when we stopped off to meet up with another group that we knew. Tom was on his new Honda with me on the back, and I was desperate for him to let me have a go with it. 
I didn't actually have a full bike license though I had ridden the less powerful Suzuki that he'd had before. But I'd never tried anything as heavy and powerful as his new bike. So he wasn't keen. That upset me so like a fool. I started to flirt with another biker called Mike who rode with the other gang. I knew he'd always fancied me and had tried it on a few times. Since I'm being honest here, I'll admit that me and him had had a bit of history when Tom hadn't been around. Never gone too far with him mind you, but we had got way beyond simply kissing a few times. I can hardly believe what I'm hearing Maddie. I cried out. It seemed implausible that my child's mother could have behaved in such a way. James. It was all a few years ago, she said, her expression turning pitiful. I'm a few years older and an awful lot wiser than I was then, honey. You sure you want me to continue? Yes, Maddie. I told her to keep going. This was all before I knew you. I have to admit I'm surprised by all this, but it doesn't affect how I feel about you. I had to signal for my wife to continue speaking since she stayed mute except for a sorrowful grin and another enormous sigh. Well, Tom, bless him, got pretty jealous about the way I was carrying on and the two gangs were getting a bit fractious with one another. There was going to be trouble, but me, a silly little cow, that I was just carried on enjoying the fuss that I was causing. Eventually Tom came and tried to pull me away from Mike, but I wasn't giving in. I told Mike that Tom was being mean to me and wouldn't let me have a go on his Honda. And would he let me try his Kawasaki out? There was no chance really as Mike's bike was even more powerful than the Honda, but he played along with it. He let you ride it. No, I said there was no chance, but he wanted me to get in with him and go two or three of their friends were sort of supporting them both, but at the same time trying to calm them down. But then Mike went a step further and said that if I stripped topless and rode with him, he would let me take the ago afterwards. The word topless elicited a gasp from me. What made the idiot think you'd do that? For the shocking reason that she has done it before James multiple times. Only ever on the back with Tom, of course. But a couple of times at bike rallies, I'd done the tour round completely naked. It was nothing exceptional in that crowd and quite a few girls did it, flashing everything they had. I informed her, I'm having trouble taking all this in, Maddie, while shaking my head and experiencing a dreadful stomach ache. This doesn't sound like the girl I met and married. I've told you, James, I'm older and wiser now, but at the time it was. Well, I finished asking. Fun, and she nodded and went on, attempting to maintain a weak smile. Tom did not respond until I had removed my leather jacket, t-shirt, and bra from behind. Then he seized me and yelled that I could ride his Honda if that was what it took. So, you would have removed your bra, right? I must confess that I was more captivated by her performance than by the bike riding part, and the mental image of Maddie undressing to that extent was. Well, it was influencing me in some way. You see what I'm getting at. With a straightforward, yes, she responded. You mean you would have shown them all your tits, right? Yes. Is she going to go off with him? Probably, however, I'm not entirely certain. It was my sincere wish that Tom would cave in first. I whispered, Christ, Maddie, you were quite the diva in those days, weren't you? I suppose I wish she responded with composure. However, you must realize that in such a gathering, the men are absolute rulers and the women are practically treated as property, both in public and privately. The adrenaline would pump whenever a female had the opportunity to boss one of the males around. I guess that's why there were a lot of conflicts with women. I take it he gave you the keys to the Honda? I inquired though I'll admit that my true curiosity lay in knowing whether she had removed her bra at that moment. That, though, was about to change. Yes, she continued. I reapplied my jacket, kissed Mike on the cheek to tease Tom, but I accompanied him to his Honda even though he was quite angry with me. He maintained his promise, and before I knew it, I was leisurely riding around the parking lot on Tom's back. By this point, I was thoroughly enjoying it, and I even believed that Tom had begun to accept it because I was performing so well. After that, everything became a mess. I don't understand, dot impatiently, I demanded. I suppose I had also irritated Mike, he rode up on his Kawasaki and began to chop me up. Tom became irate and ordered me to halt, but I was smart and kept going faster. After Mike bolted out of the parking lot, I chased after him despite Tom's yelling at me to stop. I turned back and put my arm around Maddie, urging her to take her time because I could see tears welling up in her eyes nevertheless. She refused to listen and continued narrating her narrative, eventually breaking down in tears as she neared the end. 
I foolishly pursued after Mike as he accelerated at an ever-increasing rate. It was thrilling, so I disregarded Tom's yelling orders to halt and kept going. My hunch that it wouldn't end nicely was correct Maddie did. In fact, start to cry at this point, her wailing being so pathetic that I lost comprehension of her story. It took her a few more minutes to complete telling it. Mike slid over and rode with us, urging me to increase my speed, while Tom went ballistic on the back, repeatedly slamming me to slow down. Though I refrained from doing so, I made an effort to sidestep Mike. I was unsuccessful, though. I completely lost it. Maddie, what transpired? While holding her and she sobbed uncontrollably, recalling what was clearly a horrific event, I questioned her softly. I lost control of the Honda, and it careened off the road and into Mike's vehicle. What followed was a period of unconsciousness during which I woke up in a hospital, having been in a coma for some time. Tom was lucky to escape with only minor injuries, but I had a serious concussion. And this Mike guy, I said. Whatever became of him, Maddie. The end. Could it be? Me. Yes, I am dead. What a disaster. Exactly. Jackly. But then, my darling, what transpired, please explain. Tom was merely a passenger while you rode the bike. What led to his incarceration? He accepted the responsibility. James, she wailed. By the time I woke up and realized what was going on, it was too late. Tom was the one who took the fall after telling the authorities that he was the one in the front seat. My objection was that it was you, not him, Maddie. I know. My darling, I'm trying to figure out why he would do that. Why would he accept responsibility? Because he loved me, she said plainly. I was his woman and he wanted to protect me. What a disaster. Exactly. This is not a complete sentence. I knew there was more to this story and I had to know it all. By that point, we were both sick of talking about it, so we hunkered down on the couch and said nothing for what felt like an eternity. Do you have anything else to share with me, Maddie? Finally, I spoke up surely there's more to Tom's behavior than what you've informed me about. According to Maddie, you're right, of course, it's hard to believe. But at that moment, Tom was completely clean with the authorities. Aside from a few traffic stops and fines for speeding, he had no real criminal record. Tom informed the authorities that he had been behind the wheel after the collision since he didn't think anything bad would happen to Mike after the incident. It wasn't very significant, so he took the blame. I, on the other hand, had a couple of convictions, but Tom was afraid they would punish me. Did you have two convictions? My mouth dropped open as I waited for more admissions. My God, Maddie, were you a criminal in any way? Not exactly, James Maddie said with a guilty smile as she gave me her rundown of her past exploits. Both were intended for sexually explicit content. What the heck? Riding round in the nude on the back of a bike on a camping site was one thing, but the cops didn't take kindly to us doing it through the middle of town. It was twice, I asked. More than twice, she said quietly. I got caught three times, but they let me off the first time. Then she continued by detailing how Mike's condition had suddenly deteriorated and been unexpectedly tagged out, and how Tom had remained true to his tale in order to save Maddie from harm, but his case was botched in court, and he received an incredibly lengthy term. It seems like you have a lot of debt to this Tom guy. Maddie, I muttered as she ceased talking. When is he scheduled to appear? James, that is the issue. Although he has a few more years to serve, I recently learned that he is being released due to excellent behavior and is receiving a remission. And when? Thursday she caught me off guard with. The day after tomorrow. That's why I've been upset for the last couple of weeks. What? A disaster. For a time, I buried my face in my hands and pondered. Despite my doubts, I couldn't ask Maddie to leave this person after all he had done for her she owed him a lot. Although I despised it, I had no choice but to obey because she was my wife and I loved her. Aside from getting in trouble for something he didn't do, the unfortunate bastard's mother passed away and his girlfriend wed someone else. I hope my assumption is wrong. I don't think he has anywhere to go when he gets out. Does he? I whispered under my breath. Not really, she let me down. His mum's house was only rented and he's lost touch with his old friends up in Leeds. Please wait a moment. Here, something was slipping my mind. How are you aware of that? 
Maddie, I asked her. How do you know so much about him if he's in prison up north somewhere? He's not up north, James, Maddie whispered. I could scarcely make out her response. He was, but he got into some fights up there and they transferred him. Asking, where do I already knew the answer before I had spoke it? Bedford, she whispered. Right here in Bedford prison. What a crazy coincidence, I said with a hint of irony. Sorry, James, honey. I know I should have told you long ago, but I kept avoiding it, and it simply got more and more impossible to tell you. I felt trapped and didn't know how to get out of it. So your frequent trips into Bedford were to visit him then. With her shoulders shrugged, she began to speak, but she stopped short as we both stared at one other, unsure of how to go. Tears were still trickling down her cheeks. I moved down here to be near him, James. I thought everything would work out, but I didn't reckon on meeting someone else, honey. I didn't reckon on meeting you. I just didn't allow for falling in love with another man. What are we going to do now then, Maddie? I don't know, James. Prior to this, I had already stated that I knew what to do. Maddie owed the guy a lot of money, and she was my wife, even though I didn't know him. It is time to show generosity. Listen, Maddie, I began. I don't like the idea, but I suppose he could come and stay here for a few days. Long enough for him to find somewhere. Perhaps we can help him out with a few bob to get him started. Can't do that, James. Why not, I asked. Somewhat relieved that she didn't think it was a good idea. I don't think that would suit him, James. Why the hell not, I said, my voice rising to a level of discomfort that betrayed my lack of comprehension given the situation. He doesn't know about you, James. He. He. He doesn't. Tom doesn't know I'm married, James. I'm so sorry, honey, but I never had the guts to tell him, and he still thinks that I'm waiting for him to get out. I've made a right mess of it all, haven't I? Oh, shit. Exactly. Bear. Here is the information you requested. We spent the remainder of the evening avoiding each other as we attempted to figure out what to do in our own heads, which was a real pain. I made it plain that she would have to tell Tom the truth on her next visit because the longer she waited, the tougher it would get when we did get back to talking. Considering she was usually such a methodical and honest person, I was genuinely enraged by her lack of intelligence. However, I had my wife Maddie to consider, whom I adored deeply, and our daughter Beth to keep in mind as well. Sure thing, Beth. Finally, the issue had emerged. Even though I hadn't pressed Maddie on the matter, I now saw that she clearly still had deep feelings for Tom. I wasn't concerned about her long-term commitment because Maddie and I had Beth together. My heart longed to tell her to tell this Tom guy to go away, but I knew it would be a bad idea. Maddie needed to figure this out on her own, and it was my responsibility to assist her. The day following his release, Beth went to see Tom to break the news to him. I took the day off work to be by her side when she returned home, knowing that she would need my support through this difficult task. I stayed home, my emotions churning and boiling as I anticipated her return and worried about her condition. At the door, I said, Hi Maddie as she made her way up our garden path. How did it go? How did Tom take it? As she slipped past me, she said, He didn't in a way that was a little perplexing. What do you mean he didn't? I didn't tell him James Maddie said without turning to look at me. He was so excited, like the best day in his life. I just couldn't do it, James. I just couldn't break his heart when he was so happy. Please, Maddie, I began to yell at her in an angry tone. You think it's going to be any easier for him tomorrow? You think he's going to be any less upset? Grow up, you silly woman. As soon as Maddie nailed me with the statement, I'm not going to tell him tomorrow. Tom, I knew. I've made up my mind, James. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to give him a few days of happiness before I destroy him. That's the least that I owe him, James, whatever it cost me. As the implications of my wife's words sank in, I stood there with my mouth hanging wide. I asked with a hint of anxiety, a few days of happiness. Yes, James, she finally said, her expression turning one of resolve. I've booked a hotel room in town for tomorrow night, and I fully intend to give Tom some payback for what he has done for me. Absolutely not, Maddie, I yelled out. If you think I'm going to stand by while another man beds my wife, then you've got another thing coming. Christ woman, I know you owe him, but this is ridiculous. You can't stop me. James, she said in response. This is my decision, my body, and I will do what I think is right. 
I owe him a lot, James. Please try to understand. I do understand. You're going to let another man have sex with you. It's not going to happen, Maddie. It's just not going to happen. I've already made up my mind, James. No way, Maddie. I'll do it, James, darling. Please, why can't you understand? When you get home, Maddie, I threaten not to be here. If you let him sleep with you even once, our marriage will go down the drain. I was hoping you'd be more understanding. James, she started to plead with me for help. You know the situation I'm in, and I have to do this. Please, James, try to understand. There's nothing to understand, I yelled out in a more aggressive tone. Then there's absolutely nothing to discuss, she retorted with an angry tone. Damn you, James. Why can't you understand? I'm not taking anything away from you. Damn you, too. You do it, and we're finished. She skipped out of the room, slamming the door behind her, and I was left standing there confused. That was the end. I attempted to approach her later that night for a conversation, but she simply ignored me after she saw that I wasn't budge. She had no idea how she was damaging our relationship. I wanted to strangle the foolish cow. And where does Beth stand? What about Beth, whose life was about to be shattered? Oh my goodness. This is not a complete sentence. After a decent night's sleep in the guest room, I roused Beth, helped her get dressed, and cooked her breakfast. I had intended to take Maddie away for the day so that we wouldn't be there, and I didn't want to stand by and watch as she committed adultery. Who cares? I'm taking another day off. As I was ready to go, Maddie whispered to me, I'll see you sometime tomorrow, James, while she kissed and fussed over Beth. As she also attempted to kiss me, I grumpily said, Maybe, maybe not, and pushed her aside. Please, James, don't be like this, she nearly cried out in pain. It'll all be all right, honey, I promise you. It won't be all right, Maddie. Please change your mind. Then Beth spoke up what's wrong with mummy her mother had begun to cry, according to Beth. With a swift embrace, I told her, she's just being stupid, sweetheart, before hurriedly leaving the room. This is not a complete or accurate statement. My day with Beth, which began with a visit to the Whipsnade Zoo and ended with, rather predictably, McDonald's wasn't terrible overall. I made up my mind that I should take my kid out more often even if I wasn't too enthusiastic about the idea of possibly doing it alone in the future. As much as I could, I put myself in Maddie's shoes and attempted to comprehend the difficulty she was experiencing. Despite my best efforts, I was unable to condone her behavior. Then I attempted to empathize with Tom, although I knew I would have a hard time doing so. What did the cow do to send that poor sod to prison for his feelings for a woman? This is a complete disaster. My young daughter greeted us at the door and said, Daddy, when will mummy be home? I tried to be lighthearted when I informed her. She's gone away for the night. My darling, she'll be back soon. Who's she gone with daddy? I answered, just a friend choosing not to elaborate. I was taken aback by her question. Is it Tom? I had never thought my daughter would have any knowledge of him. In my anxious voice, I needed to know, how do you know about Tom? Mummy and I go and visit him daddy when we go into Bedford. It's not very nice where he lives, but Mummy says he can't come and live with us because the men there says he has to stay where he is. Incredulous, I glanced at my small kid. My sweet wife turned out to be quite the snitch when I wasn't looking. Not only did she trick Tom and me, but she also took our daughter my daughter to visit the Critton in that dreadful prison. I started to question whether I actually knew my wife. With a continuation of Mummy said that Tom would be getting out soon, Daddy Beth continued. What does getting out mean? It means that he won't have to live in that nasty place anymore. Sweetheart, I hurriedly informed her. Oh, good was her response. He's really nice as Tom. Will he be able to come and live with us then? Merely responding. I don't think so. Beth was my tone. I just don't think that would be possible. I resented putting my daughter to bed that night since it had been a horrible day. It was one of those unusual instances when she had to express her exhaustion and want to sleep to me. Even though I didn't particularly enjoy the prospect of spending the remainder of the evening by myself, I capitulated and carried her to her bedroom when she fell asleep in my arms. Obviously, the phone call was useless. Hi, honey, Maddie said as I grudgingly answered the phone. I said, what do you want in a rough throat? Please, James, don't be that way, she begged. I'm just ringing to make sure you're both okay. Beth's fine, I assured her. She's up in bed. And you... James Maddie asked with a low voice. 
Are you okay? I ignored her question and shouted irritably, Have you had sex yet? Please, James. May. I interrupted her and said, Have you had sex yet with more volume? James. Please. Answer the question I yelled at her. Yes, he did, Maddie assured me. He and I had sex not once, but twice. I hope you enjoyed it, cheater. She lost her temper and blurted out over the phone, Yes, what's more, he knows how to pleasure a woman. But there was a long pause after that comment since I was startled by what she said, and, I assume, she understood the gravity of her words. She finally yelled out, James, honey, after what seemed like an eternity. I didn't mean to say that, honey. I swear I didn't. My pride went flying and my heart was shattered. I have no idea how she completed that statement. With great care, I placed the phone back on its cradle and stood there, my eyes welling up with tears. The alarm went off again a few seconds later, but this time I snatched the cord and severed it from its socket. I struggled to locate the power button, failed miserably, and hurled my phone against the wall with all my might when it began to beep a minute or two later. At the moment it broke, the beeping stopped, and I stood there silently, with real tears already falling down my cheeks. Standing there, I bawled wept as my wife awaited the return of her lover to attend to her needs, cried out in despair as I hated the world and everything in it, and felt a crushing sense of isolation. Here is the information you requested. I remained there for at least an hour, wondering what had happened, and to be honest, hoping that Maddie would come and fix everything. Sure enough, she never returned, so clearly it wasn't feasible. The realization that I would need to muster courage on behalf of my daughter Beth was the catalyst that finally got me moving. To me, she was everything, and having her gave me the strength to keep going. Sitting down with a mug of tea, the antidote to all evils, I contemplated the impending transformation of my life. Would I re-adopt Maddie? Holy cow, that's a tough one. I was strongly advised against it by every system in my body. My emotions, however, conveyed a different message, one that I was hardly able to decipher. For Beth's sake, the one thing I knew for sure was that I had to be strong. Notwithstanding Maddie's best efforts, I would do whatever it took to keep her by my side. I considered returning Maddie to Beth if it meant she would be okay, but I quickly realized I was being ridiculous. For whatever reason, I desperately wanted Maddie back, even though I knew it would never be the same. It was hopeless, and it would never happen, and my emotions welled up again as I considered the misery that was about to befall the innocent little child who slept peacefully upstairs, oblivious to the chaos going on all around her. I don't understand why you felt the need to hurt the people that care about you, Maddie. The next morning, I felt a gentle touch on my face. Wake up. Daddy, I managed to mutter under my conscious confusion. Why didn't you go to bed last night? Good morning. My love, I murmured to her somewhat drowsily. I just fell asleep on the sofa and forgot to go to bed. When I told Mummy, she would think you're foolish, Beth said with a grin. Silly daddy. With a heavy sigh, I responded, It seems like Mummy already thinks I'm a fool as the circumstances once again weighed heavily on my already overburdened shoulders. Daddy's taken a day off work to look after you again. Where do you want to go? Daddy, would you let us go to the zoo? My daughter asked with a joyous clap of her hands. But we were there yesterday, my darlings, I said, gesturing toward her. But I want to go again, Daddy, she responded with a giggle. I want to see the big elephants and the funny monkeys, and, and, what do they call those big ones with the long funny neck daddy? Giraffes, my darling, I responded, but you saw them all yesterday. How about we go to Old Warden and see the old airplanes? Do they have lions and tigers and things there? I told her, no, Beth, they don't while secretly yearning to see the vintage aircraft museum I hadn't visited in years if only to distract myself, but they do have lots of other interesting things. Do they have a McDonald's there, Daddy? I basically ended it by saying that they probably wouldn't, but we could find one on the way home. Indeed, we were returning to the zoo 30 minutes after our first departure. I was able to temporarily put my problems aside and enjoy watching my daughter play for a few hours because it was a wonderful day. Maybe when she grew older, she'd work as a veterinarian. After we left McDonald's with our bellies full of triple-something burgers and frothy milkshakes, the cloud once again descended. I don't know how I could possibly screw this wrong. I don't know how I could end our marriage and make Beth's life so difficult. 
perhaps Maddie and I can put our differences with Tom in the past and move on in a few years when she makes a mistake. Could be. We returned home to find tiny Beth all curled up on the sofa, ready to hit the hay. And yes, I ended up hauling her sleeping bag upstairs for the second night running. Everything was going swimmingly until I had to figure out when Maddie would return on my own. I had no clue as to when she would return home because we hadn't talked about it. She had disclosed her plans, and since then, all we had done was yell at each other. As soon as she did, I vowed to myself that I would control my emotions and speak more rationally. Although I could empathize with her situation, I insisted that she see things from my perspective. I wasn't sure we could get over what seemed like her infidelity to me, but I figured I'd give it my all for Beth's sake. That is, unless she also did it. I hung around till 9 o'clock, confident that she would return at that hour. After that, I waited 10 more minutes before I became extremely irate all over again. The reconnected phone beeped at 25 minutes after 10. Hello. James Dawson here, I said with caution. James, are you feeling better today compared to last night? The woman's voice inquired. Not much, Maddie, I responded. When are you planning to return home? James, if I return in the morning, will you speak to me rationally and not yell at me, she said, her words evoking the memory of the day she initially informed me she was pregnant with Beth. I snapped back at her, saying, tomorrow morning. You're due back tonight. James, the plan has changed. Are you going to be reasonable about this or what she declared? Before responding, I counted to five to calm myself. Did you inform him yet? Ignoring her inquiry, I asked, Is he aware that we are married? Yes, James, he does. What about? As if addressing the topic of a person being informed they had been cut from the village football team, Maddie informed me. He took it quite well, all things considered. He did a lot better than you did. Yes, I replied, struggling not to yell at her. And where exactly were the two of you when he took the news so well? No response. And exactly what were the two of you doing when you gave him the news, Maddie, I kept going? Or had you already finished? It remains unanswered. I'll see you when you get back home, Maddie, I declared to the silent phone. Then we'll decide whether this is still your home or not. At this point, Maddie placed the phone on me and I could hear a click. I roused Beth from her slumber, made her beloved breakfast, and whisked her away to her weekly dancing class. In case I couldn't return in time, I had arranged for another mother to take her and look after her. In my explanation, I mentioned that Maddie usually takes her, but she has been gone for a few nights. I couldn't help but worry how much longer it would be till word got out. That's okay, I was informed by another mom. Beth can stay with us all day if you want to have some catch-up time with Maddie. I uttered the words, gratitude. Despite my best efforts, I doubt I was able to muster a smile. When I got back to our house 15 minutes later and found Maddie's car parked in its usual spot in front of the house, my heart raced. Maddie yelled out, Where's Beth as soon as I shut the door? I responded abruptly, Where do you think? James, you haven't done anything foolish. Have you? She charged me with almost an accusation. Depends on whether taking her to her dancing lessons is stupid or not. Maddie whispered in embarrassed, Oh, yes, I forgot. It was a long way to the finish, but that was round one for me. Listen, James, she began to speak once more. Tom's been really good about all this mess and made me realize that I'm not being very fair to you. If we can just sit down and talk this all through, then we both think that we can come up with something that works for all three of us. When you say all four of us, I'm assuming you mean my sister and me. Aren't you forgetting Beth? James, Maddie hurried in with an affirmative response. Of course, I mean all four of us. So, it's round two for me too. The future didn't seem very bright, but I was racking up points. I signaled to her that she should continue. The fact is, James, that I truly do love you and always will. But now Tom's back. Everything's changed, hasn't it? How's that? I don't think I ever stopped loving him. James, I heard my wife say. I'm sorry, James, but I love two men. The problem is I decided to broach the subject again. The other is better at giving you pleasure than your husband. James, she blurted out. I didn't mean to say that. I got angry, lost my temper, and frankly, I didn't want to say it. But it's true, isn't it? 
So what Maddie cried out. What difference does that make? I've never complained about your performance and never will. I shot her down, saying, damn right. You never will, you never will. Because you'll never get the chance to compare us again. Please, James, she implored, her resolve unwavering. Please just at least listen to what Tom and I have worked out. Please listen, James. She continued in a more assured tone, and I shrugged my shoulders, half agreeing to listen. We, meaning me and Tom, thought we could make a deal between the three of us. I could continue to live here with you and Beth so we'd be like a little family, and Tom would get an apartment or something nearby. So you could see him, I suppose I asked with a note of doubt. Yes, of course, but I'd spend most nights here with you, James, but half the nights with him. Oh no, James, half the nights wouldn't be either Maddie grumbled, understandably upset by the situation. Do you seriously think I'm going to agree to this, Maddie whispered I. You get the best of both worlds. Tom gets his freedom and I get a cuckold who will probably support all of us. I guess not, she replied. Not when you put it that way. Listen, Maddie, I started to say. Call Tom now and tell him to get the hell back to Leeds and I, I repeat, I can take you back. Listen, James, I'm not very impressed by this offer, Maddie said with a hint of sadness. I told her plainly, it's the best I can do. Maddie, but I wasn't sure I wanted her to try. I guess I'll have to pass then, James. When you leave, please be sure to close the door behind you. I thought I had finished it. Maddie then inquired, what about Beth later on? She'll have to live with me and Tom. According to my venomous response, over my dead body, Maddie. To prevent that from occurring, I would do anything. We'll see, James, I said to Maddie. If you think you can keep Beth, then you've got some surprises coming. I admonished Maddie, piss off and spat at her angry. No court in the world would grant custody of your child if you remained with your jailbird sweetheart. Yes, Maddie did close the front door, and she almost ripped it off its hinges before she stood up, walked out, and departed. I didn't think so. In fact, I had a horrible feeling that the game hadn't even begun yet. I waited four or five days for a response from the two of them, which felt like being in the trenches during World War I, waiting for the next salvo or major attack to overwhelm me. I did take advantage of an opportunity to see my solicitor, Tim, who was also a mate of mine, but I left feeling absolutely certain that any court in the world would grant me custody of Beth, who was in a bit of a mess. 50-50, he said with sadness. If she can prove she's in a stable relationship, then the court could come down on her side. But he's a jailer, I tried to object. I mean, he killed someone, of course, that wasn't true. But even Tim didn't know that. James, my friend told me, he killed someone in an accident. He's paid his price to society and has the same rights as anyone else thus, I learned. How does he seem? Does he appear suspicious in any way? Could you tell me what evidence we have against him? The truth was that I had no clue since I had never met him. No idea who he is. Perhaps you should James. While Beth's beloved mummy was away, I had been killing her with my caring and attention, making up all sorts of reasons why. Tell me, Dad, when is mommy coming home? She asked me in a drowsy voice. I told her, soon, sweetheart, though I still couldn't bring myself to tell her the truth. I miss mummy. As I passionately embraced her, tears welled up in my eyes, and I whispered, so do I, sweetheart, my heart ached for that woman. If you were to ask me, I would tell you directly. I was surprised to learn that I would be meeting up with this Tom guy more quickly, and with less difficulty than I had anticipated when my friend called to invite me to a meeting with the other parties and their lawyer. I pretended to be brave as I entered the meeting, taken aback by the appearance of this Tom guy. I had imagined him to be a greasy, long-haired wastrel, but the tall, clean-cut, fair-haired, somewhat slender, and athletic man who welcomed me caught me off guard. Hello, James, he said nervously, extending his hand to shake mine. I'm sorry this is the way we have to meet, actually. I'm sorry for everything. Oh my goodness. Despite my best intentions, I ended myself taking the guy's hand and shaking it. I kept my grin to a minimum, so maybe this wouldn't be as challenging as I had anticipated. Boy, was I mistaken. They're overweight. Smirking lawyer introduced the case as Mr. Dawson saying, it's obvious that your wife isn't going to accept you back, so there's no point in you pursuing that avenue. In an effort to dissuade me from attacking the Wally, 
my solicitor, Tim, reached out and accepted the challenge. I don't think my client is interested in that possibility either he put it back. As far as we are concerned, it is just a matter of deciding your client's access to the daughter of the marriage my client is willing to grant reasonable access to his soon-to-be ex-wife. I said, even though she will live with him and obviously be main caregiver. Fatal responded with a smile like a crocodile. Not that easy. My clients, that is my clients, have a superior claim to the child. How utterly ridiculous. Tim indicated for me to calm down after I yelled out. Are we in agreement that my client, Mrs. Dawson, is the child's mother? That fact is not up for debate, Fatty went on to say. Are we? Tim looked as perplexed by the other guy's line of reasoning as I was when he admitted the truth and gave me a strange look. Then, we also have to acknowledge who the father is the jerk continued, and this time Tim had to literally pull me away from him. My clients claim that Mr. Dawson is not the father of the child, and the father is her ex-boyfriend Mr. Thomas Wellings. Wait, Tom is Beth's father. I couldn't believe it and sat there with my jaw dropped. According to medical records, we can say with absolute certainty that Mr. Wellings is the biological father of the child. Your client, Mr. Dawson, is obviously not the father and we have proof to back it up. Beth is my daughter. What utter nonsense are you stating I yelled out at the overweight jerk? She was born to me and I've since purchased her. I am the one. I am. It seems not, Mr. Dawson Fatty flanked me. You may have raised her as your own daughter, but you are not her biological father. I represent Mr. Wellings. However, that is not feasible, I objected. He was incarcerated during Maddie's pregnancy. I was present at her birth for the sake of Christ. It's simply not feasible. My clients have explained that Mr. Dawson, he continued monotonally. Apparently you were away in Canada when Mr. Wellings' mother died and he was granted compassionate leave from prison to attend her funeral. The funeral was attended by my client, Mrs. Dawson, who was Miss Jones at the time, and they, what if, instead, they were given the chance to reacquaint themselves? I felt the room spin as I absorbed his words. I couldn't believe it, yet I knew it was possible. Beth was growing up to be tall, slim, and fair-haired, exactly like her dad. I was dark and, well, somewhat stocky. Oh, no. Maddie sobbed and bolted out of the room. As the room spun around me, Tom sprang to his feet to chase after her, but he halted. I'm sorry, James, he informed me. I swear to you, Maddie had no idea that you weren't Beth's father till she started to grow up and looked like me. Is that an alibi for her? Does that justify you having sex with her? While she was practically engaged to me, shouted I to him. No, he murmured, his voice barely audible as he shook his head in agreement. Maddie has no grounds to justify her actions, but I adore her, and, and, oh my God, James, I am so sorry. He then pivoted to follow Maddie out of the office. Well, mister. Dawson, the overweight lawyer, began to speak up once more. Is it possible for us to work out a compromise here? It would be great if we could figure something out. I have a lot going on today. The other solicitor was scolded by Tim, who jumped to his feet before I could respond. You wretched bastard. Stop talking. If you utter one more syllable, I will personally force your nose to poke through the opposite side of your face. Fatty snottily remarked, not very professional, but he still got to his feet, gathered his documents, and scampered out of the office in a flash. You'll be hearing from me. After he departed, my friend and personal legal eagle sighed and said, I didn't see that one coming, I was embarrassed. I didn't either. I should probably mention that I last laid eyes on Maddie as she bolted from that office. Had I known that at the time, maybe my actions in the subsequent period would have been different, but now that I think about it, maybe not. My story doesn't end there. Tim called his secretary, and told her to cancel everything for the rest of the day. Despite her protestations, he practically dragged me off to the nearest pub. We drank the first three pints in the time it took to order them. Five or six of my best friends showed up to help me drink myself to sleep. I don't remember much of the next day, but my first coherent thought was waking up in a strange bed with an equally strange, but very attractive female body cuddled up to me. It was never clear to me who paid the girl, but whoever it was, I certainly didn't. Then the girl vanished and I never saw her again. Unless she was nude and had a rose tattoo on her privates, I wouldn't have recognized her even if she were standing before me. So that's the purpose of having friends, I suppose. I won't pretend that a black cloud descended on me and I withdrew from the world. 
I'm the sort of guy who thinks his beer glass is half full, rather than half empty, and with that positive attitude I set forth to make a life for myself. Okay, the black cloud was there sure enough, but I did try my best. I dated everything that came my way, whether pretty or not, but found myself going for women with children, single mothers or divorced. As you may imagine, this made me pretty popular, and I got my just reward pretty frequently, but the only one of them that I started to grow feelings for dumped me when she accused me of only wanting me for her daughter. That's right, I was trying, perhaps too hard, to replace my daughter Beth. I was trying to find a partner with a Beth substitute. I know it's crazy, but that's how I was affected. You may be asking, what about Beth herself and I would respond, yes, I did insist on access to her, despite there being no actual blood connection between us after I finally recognized my problem and tried to limit it, the number of women I dated decreased, which was a good thing. However, that was an absolute failure. I had to travel up to Leeds one weekend to visit Maddie, but to be fair, neither Maddie nor Tom had objected in fact. They had done everything they could to make my trip easier. Tom was the one I spoke to whenever I called, and he was the one who welcomed me when I came to collect Beth Maddie had, maybe wisely, kept herself to herself. However, that was a failure. Beth, who was utterly bewildered, spent the entire day attempting to convince me to move in with them. She was too young to comprehend how improbable that was, so she went on and on about it. She also refused to accept that Daddy no longer loved Mummy, so she kept gushing about how wonderful Daddy Tom was and how happy I would be there. As soon as I brought Beth back to the house, she began to cry at the thought that I was going to abandon her. She clung to me, sobbing uncontrollably, and had a tantrum. Eventually, Tom had to remove her from me and hold her as I bolted from the house, my tears matching hers. It was terrible and broke my heart yet again. Perhaps worse than previously, it was the most awful decision that I'd ever made in my life. But I vowed there and then that there would be no more visits. I couldn't put little Beth through that agony again, and I didn't think that I could put myself through it either. When I told Tom of my decision, he actually tried to get me to change my mind, saying they'd do all they could to make it less traumatic next time, but deep down we both knew that it had to be for the best. Eventually, we sort of agreed that I'd give it six months to give Beth time to settle down in her new life. And then we'd see. We agreed that, but we both knew what that really meant, and that was that for her sake, I would no longer feature in her life. Maybe when she was grown up, I promised myself. Maybe when she graduated or something. I promised myself all sorts of things, but the reality was that I was totally on my own again, memories of my wife and daughter being just that memories. The fact that I wasn't suicidal is something for which I will be eternally thankful. A ton of. Life progressed as it always does, and my painful memories gradually faded. They say time heals all wounds, but I can assure you it isn't a miracle cure. You have to work at it, and I worked at it, carving myself a new life. I couldn't let the first Christmas pass without doing something, so I went out and bought a present for Beth and sent it off, unsure of how to sign it or reveal its sender because I didn't want to reopen the old pain. To my surprise, I received a letter from Leeds the week after Christmas. Beth had written me a little letter of gratitude, and she shared some details about her life. It was clear that someone had helped her, and I couldn't help but feel a strong sense that it was Tom, and not my ex-wife. I wondered if she had any idea that Tom was. She addressed me as Daddy James throughout the correspondence. Despite the fact that it degraded me and meant that Daddy was probably now Tom, I was incredibly pleased up by the knowledge that Beth had two loving parents and that she might remember me by a name. Holy cow, James. I still sent her gifts on her birthday and Christmas, and I kept getting letters of gratitude and pictures of her growing handwriting, which I took pride in seeing. Over the next few years or so, Tom would occasionally slip me a note to let me know how she was doing at school or dancing lessons, but he never once mentioned that I was visiting. I suppose I secretly hoped that we would meet up again soon. After a year or so, Beth mentioned her little brother in one of her letters, and I decided I should probably stop trying to get involved any further. Tom and Maddie had two children, and I was never a part of their family. I am a student. Now, it should come as no surprise that my friend Tim's wife had a friend well, she had many friends, of course, but you get the picture. Her name was Sally, and she was a solicitor. She was a few years younger than me, had dark hair, was slim, and had the most incredible legs I've ever seen. Just mentioning her here implies that Sally became someone special. Our interests were so complimentary that it was as if we were destined to be together. In the end, I proposed. We were both divorced, working, and really in love. 
Oh, and by the way, the sex was great too, in case you were curious. Oh, James, she said with a wide grin. I would be absolutely thrilled to. Nevertheless, there was an inescapable but lurking beneath the surface. Hello, Sally. I inquired, honestly taken aback by the possibility of a but being applied. I am familiar with your past, James, she whispered back. It's likely that you will desire a family, won't you? As I smiled and returned her question, sure, I will, I went on to say, at least two, maybe more. James, my last marriage ended because I was unable to have children, I was taken aback by her statement. For the sake of his family line, my ex-husband was in desperate need of a son. You never informed me about that, I muttered, recalling that her ex-husband David had been a small baronet or something, which would explain the significance of a son, who was at fault. James, my dear. The tests came back normal for David, but my eggs weren't quite right. Certainly doable, but I wouldn't put money on it. And that was the sole reason he divorced you. David always seemed such a nice, reasonable sort of guy. Whenever I've met him, I inquired with a hint of surprise. Thank you for that. No, it wasn't just that Sally responded with a hint of melancholy. But it was that little problem that led to the arguments and eventually we will, however, end up divorcing. Sally, I apologize deeply. I was completely confused. Why didn't you consider adopting instead? I would have, but David's family were dead set against it, and in the end it drove a wedge between us. Sad, I remarked. Very sad, she concurred. But then I never would have met you in the first place, would I? Then you're going to marry me, I unexpectedly said. We continued talking about possible adoption or other artificial means which Sally, with her history, knew more about than I did. Honestly, there were a lot of things to think about, and neither of us was getting any younger. Sally was worried that another marriage would fail for the same reason, and I tried to reassure her that I would accept it. In three months. Why don't you re-ask me? Finally, Sally offered a suggestion after you've given it some thought. How about we wait three months, and then you tell me what you think? Before, if you so desire, I retorted. We left it at that. I wanted her to say yes, but I had my doubts. I wanted a child, more than one, to be honest, and adoption and all that made me feel a little uncertain. Our relationship started to show little cracks where none had been before, and it wasn't necessary. We weren't breaking up or anything, we were still very happy together. But the question of marriage got quietly pushed to the back burner. Supposedly, there is always a silver lining to every cloud. I wasn't contemplating clouds that morning as I sat in my office trying to figure out how to rationalize a substantial investment in a new project I was spearheading. The last thing I needed was a phone call to disrupt my train of thought, particularly one that had nothing to do with my pet project. Excuse me, mister, Dawson asked the unfamiliar and rather officious sounding voice. Mister, is he James Dawson? As I continued to nonchalantly respond, that's me my focus remained fixed on how to make a quarter of a million appear like spending money. I have to ask you a couple of security questions, mister. Dawson. All right, I returned, my annoyance at the interruption lingering a little. But let me ask you, who are you? Mrs. Murphy from Headingley Social Services, and I'm sorry the returning voice said with an air of anything but regret. Headingley means lead suburb. With my attention piqued, I responded, I know exactly where Headingley is, Mrs. Murphy. What can I do for you? Mr. James Edward Dawson, I take it. That's me. D. You were wed to Mrs. Madeline Dawson before she became Mrs. Wellings, right. She was being overly formal, and I found it annoying, so I said, that's me again. Could you kindly provide me the middle name of your ex-wife as a security measure? Jean, I whispered back. She was so pleased that she proceeded to ask me her date of birth, to which I once again gave the correct response. What is the point of this? I made my demand with a little more force. Headingly Social Security Services are charged with sorting out some outstanding matters concerning the late Mrs. Wellings. The late Mrs. Dawson, I inquired, instantly recognizing that she must have been Tom's mother. However, she passed away a number of years ago, and I never had the pleasure of meeting the lady. What does that even mean for me? Mrs. Wellings passed away six days ago, Mr. Dawson, the voice said again. A motorcycle accident claimed her life and her husband's as well. What on earth? 
Surely she didn't do. The woman. The woman. I was so stunned by her statements that I almost let go of the phone as my voice trailed off. The social security woman went on to say, I thought you would have known. I apologize, Mr. Dawson. Where does Beth stand? As the terrifying thoughts raced through my mind, I let out a scream. She's all right, isn't she? Please tell me she's okay. The woman went on. She's somewhat upset, sir, as the first hint of humanity emerged. She wasn't involved in the accident, but she's obviously very upset. She's been asking for you, but it's taken us a few days to track you down. I nearly raised my voice to ask, where is she across the phone? I'm leaving now. I'll come and get her. I was in my car and out of the parking lot in five minutes after the woman informed me that they had her information and the address my critical assignment had slipped my mind. This is not a complete or accurate statement. As I sat in Mrs. Murphy's somewhat rundown office, having persuaded her of my identity and the fact that I wanted Beth without a doubt, I was incredibly anxious. Surprisingly, I learned that Tom and Maddie hadn't taken any action to alter the situation, and naturally, I hadn't heard anything regarding an adoption request. Since her birth certificate listed me as Beth's father, I was still technically her legal father. Imagine that. I suppose I was saddened to hear about Maddie and Tom's downfall, especially in light of what she had done to me, but I was so thrilled to be reuniting with Beth that those sentiments hadn't fully settled in just yet. On the other hand, I neglected to consider anything else entirely. The door finally pounded, and a different woman entered the room, her hand firmly gripping Beth's. It was the first time I'd laid eyes on my long lost friend in nearly four years. Daddy, is that really you? Beth timidly inquired. Despite my best efforts to send her pictures, she hadn't laid eyes on me since she was four years old. Holding out my arms to her, I coughed out the words, Yes, it's me, sweetheart, as the first tear ran down my cheek. Daddy, daddy, I've missed you. I knew you'd come for me, she yelled out as she dashed towards me. It wasn't until I cradled my baby in my arms that the other item I mentioned I'd forgotten about suddenly became crystal clear. I attempted to raise Beth into my arms, but something felt off. To my astonishment, I noticed another small boy desperately holding onto Beth's skirt as I looked down. My God. Oh, I completely disregarded that. Little brother was there for Beth. This is Jimmy Beth introduced me as I disappointed her once more, choosing not to win the tug of war lest I terrify the little puppy. It didn't stop the little boy from looking like he was going to cry. Looking like a proper young tot, he was probably around three years old. He has dark hair and a strong physique he could be a rugby star in the making. Despite his evident fear, he clung on courageously, uncertain of what was ahead. I flashed him a reassuring smile and said, Hello, Jimmy, but he shot me a skeptical look in return. Just wanted to give Jimmy a little boost of confidence. This is Daddy James, Jimmy Beth said. Say hello. He addressed Beth as Daddy James, who was your biological father without averting his gaze from me. It was yes, Jimmy, she informed him. Mummy and Daddy always told us how nice he was, and now he's going to be our daddy and take us away to live with him. Since nothing had been said about Jimmy, Mrs. Murphy probably wanted to correct that innocent statement, but I stopped her by raising my hand, and she was smart enough to remain silent. The words my mummy and daddy have gone to heaven came out of little Jimmy's mouth. Will you really be our new daddy? I looked at the small boy and thought, How old are you, Jimmy? So I inquired. I asked him what he meant by free, and he replied, And, and he then looked to his older sister for clarification. He's three and four months, Beth said on his behalf. His birthday is on the 7th of November. When I realized the reality, I screamed D. There was absolutely no difficulty with the math. Three years and four months later, we found ourselves back in the middle of October, adding another nine months to it. It was more than four years ago, more than a month before Tom was freed from prison. There was no room for doubt when I considered Jimmy's physique and complexion. Yeah, Jimmy was my kid. God forbid they were unaware they must have even given him the nickname Jimmy in my honor. The one time I went there, Maddie was obviously showing, so it was a surprise she wasn't there. Come and give your dad a cuddle, little man, I said with a loving smile, my heart hurting a little. He paused for an instant before flinging himself into my arms. With Beth following shortly behind, we embraced, sobbing uncontrollably, completely unaware of anyone else in the room. 
After then, everything was easy sailing. It took all of 10 minutes before a judge who had been sent to the scene was willing to grant me permission to remove Jimmy as well as Beth, so it was clear that I was within my legal rights to do so. I knew a solicitor lady who I was hoping would be willing to assist me with the documentation that would inevitably be required later on. The following day, when introducing my two new underlings, I said, this is my friend Sally noticing that her eyes were already watering. Jimmy, who was quite young, asked, are you going to be our new mummy? Beth scolded her brother Jimmy, telling him to be quiet. Daddy said that the lady was a friend of his. While I held my breath, Sally studied them for a while before speaking. Even though she was struggling to speak, she managed to say, that's okay, Beth, before starting to cry. Your dad still wants me, and I would love to be your mommy if he does. I believe you two are God's plan for our family. Considering that the offer was still there and the three months were still remaining, it's easy to see how things turned out. We went for a day outing that afternoon with Sally and the kids, holding hands the whole time as we ran, played, laughed, and stared. The dreaded zoo was our destination once again, yes. My two children had a hard time adjusting to life without their parents, Tom and Maddie, in the months and years that followed. Time, however, is a great healer, and those difficult days faded away as our children matured and Sally and I began to joyfully age together. We are eagerly anticipating the arrival of Beth's first grandchildren. She has become a veterinarian and is happily married to a young civil engineer. Having recently earned his wings, Jimmy has joined the Royal Air Force. I can't help but wonder if our many trips to Old Warden to view the museum's airplane collection sparked his interest in flying.